Once again, good morning. Glad to be here with you. I'm grateful to be here, thankful to be here with you. I am proud of you. I'm proud that you're here. I know there's a little bit of a thread of rain out there. We drove in and threw two or three little light showers coming down here from Fort Payne. But you know what they say, one drop of rain keeps 19 Baptists away. <laughs> but you're here and you're to be blessed. And I am really, really grateful and excited to hear that you've called an interim pastor. I told you a long time ago just to be patient and to be together and to trust the Lord and see step by step where he might be leading you. And that certainly is coming to pass. I've enjoyed being here. I certainly, Sue and I both have uh, received the greater blessing by being here with you these several times. I have told the good people at First Baptist Church of Fort Payne all about the special people at First Baptist Church, Williams. And so uh, some of them may show up some of these days just to see who you are because I've talked to them uh, about you in a very positive way. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. The great 100th Psalm. Probably the height of David's praise of God. And through the Psalms, David has expressed different kinds of feelings and emotions. But I think in this one, obviously, he is expressing an attitude of gratitude. An attitude of gratitude. Look at, look at these uh, imperatives in this great Psalm. Make, serve, come, know, enter, be thankful, and on and on. Gladness, singing, pasture, thanksgiving, praise, everlasting, an attitude of gratitude from David the Psalmist. There's a great illustration of an attitude of gratitude over in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 17, and you probably are familiar with this story. And Luke is telling us that Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. He is heading south from Galilee down toward Jerusalem. He knows what he's going to face. He knows what is about to happen. And all the way through Luke's gospel and really all the way into Acts, Luke kind of uses a word now and then which translated must. Jesus had to. He must. He set his face toward Jerusalem. He knew what was going on. He knew what was happening. And so he's on the way down to Jerusalem for that. And he's passing along the border of Galilee and Samaria. And Luke says that he comes to a certain village and a group of 10 lepers called out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They called him Master, and it's interesting that Luke uses this word because it's a special word that mostly only the apostles, only the 12 apostles had used. But they recognized who he was. Have mercy on us. Have you ever said, oh Lord, have mercy upon me? Lord, have mercy. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon my family. Have mercy upon this country. Lord, have mercy. We don't read the book of Lamentations very much. Lamentations were written by Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, about the time of the destruction of Jerusalem in about 587 B.C. And there's so much in there and Jeremiah is almost crying. But the famous verse in there in, Jer in Lamentations is, Great is thy faithfulness, for thy mercies are new every single morning. 
And so they stood off and they cried out, have mercy upon us. Now, they were infected with the most terrible, horrible disease known to man at that time of leprosy. And they were ostracized and they were separated from family and from friends and they couldn't even attend the temple and they couldn't even attend the, the synagogue. And the only person who would have anything to do with a leper was another leper. And they had to walk around in groups or colonies shouting, unclean, unclean, warning others that one with the most horrible, tragic disease was nearby. Death was welcome. And sometimes the New Testament uses leprosy as a metaphor for sin. All of us are infected with that metaphor, with, with, with that disease of sin, but of course, have mercy upon us, and by the grace of God, we are cleansed. And so they called out, have mercy upon us, and what did Jesus do? He just turned to them and he said, now they probably were a good distance away, go show yourself to the priest. That's all he said. That's all he did. Go show yourselves to the priest. I imagine they wondered why. Perhaps they were a little bit disappointed because I'm sure they had seen Jesus heal other lepers with the touch. They maybe had seen or heard of him healing the blind man and, and the paralyzed man. But here he simply said, go and show yourselves to the priests. Why? In the 14th chapter of the book of Leviticus, there is in the Old Testament law, the law, the Torah, the, the old law of Moses, what's called the law of the leper. When any leper was cleansed, he was to go to the priest and the priest would offer certain sacrifices for him and certain rituals and he could be restored back to his family, back to home, back into church. But if they had not been cleansed, he could do no good. They must have wondered why. But Jesus was implying, you obey me and you will be cleansed. And Luke simply says, they turned as they went, as they went, miraculously, they were cleansed. They were healed. They followed him by faith, but they obeyed and they acted on that faith. Must we do the same thing? Again, why to the priest? Well, you see, for about 1,500 years up until the point of this, this miracle, there had been on the books this law of the leper. And those priests must have wondered, why is this on here? For 1,500 years, we have never, ever cleansed, seen a, a, a healed, cleansed leper. We've never done it. But all of a sudden, leper after leper after leper began to show up to the priest to be cleansed because he had been miraculously healed when Jesus showed up. What a testimony. What a testimony to those priests when all these lepers, one after the other, came having been cleansed by the touch, by the word of Christ. But that's not the most important thing in this story. You know what it is. They all were headed back, and I'm sure they were excited, and they couldn't wait to get home and see their families and go back to, to the synagogue. But one, one man, and here Jesus, uh, Luke refers to him as the Samaritan. Jesus called him this foreigner. Perhaps the others had, had gone to the priest before they were declared unclean and, 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 and could not participate except this one Samaritan. But he is the only one who came back, Luke says, and fell down at the feet of Jesus expressing his gratitude, expressing his thankfulness. Jesus may have been disappointed. It sounds like he may have been. He welcomed this, this Samaritan, this foreigner, but then he said, I thought there were 10 of you. I thought there were 10 of you cleansed. Where are the other nine? And then he said, only this foreigner, only this, and by the way, you talk about racism, you talk about prejudice. Oh, it was awful between the Jews and the Samaritans. He said, only this foreigner, this Samaritan, has come back to express his gratitude unto me. And so that, that Samaritan had his own thanksgiving service right then and there. Psalm 105, verse 1, O give thanks unto the Lord. 
Psalm 106, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Do we identify with that Samaritan, or do we identify with the other nine? How about our attitude of gratitude? Jesus gladly accepted, accepted this man's gratitude and blessed him. And I'll mention this in a little bit. He received a blessing that the others did not. You know, it seems sometimes that there's so little real grateful, gratefulness, worship among us these days. Oh, Lord, help me, have mercy upon me, give me this, do this for me. And he does, and we just kind of go off and forget it. It's been written that this story in the New Testament is the clearest example of man's ingratitude to man and to God. Oh, Lord, bless me. Oh, Lord, bless my family. Have mercy upon me. And he does. But how grateful are we, really? Children sometimes are not grateful to parents. God's children sometimes are not, we are not grateful enough to him. King Lear said, sharper than a serpent's tooth is an ungrateful child. God's children, are we grateful to him? An attitude of gratitude. And we call out to somebody, help me, and somebody will help us. And how much, how, how, how we owe a debt of gratitude to somebody. Might be a teacher, might be a preacher, might be a doctor, might be a, a friend. Oh, help me. And he does. But then we can just kind of seem to forget and drift on away from it. Blow, blow, thou winter wind, thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude to man. Heard of a man one time who got lost in the woods. I mean, he was lost in these dark, deep woods. He began to, to panic, and he was re telling this to, to his friends and family, going over that, and they said, what did you do? He said, I fell down on my knees, and I prayed to God, and I called out to God for help. And they said, did God answer your prayer? Oh, no, he didn't have time to. The guide came along and showed me the way out. Sometimes we take these things for granted. There are some results and some benefits of an attitude of gratitude. One is this man received an assurance that the others did not. Jesus said, I say to you, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. I take this to mean that he was healed not only physically, but also spiritually. It's one thing to be, to be cleansed and to, to be saved, as we say, but another to have assurance. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and to go on cleansing us from all sins. This man received an assurance that the others more than likely did not. Another benefit of an attitude of gratitude is it, it, it leads us, it, it keeps us into the presence of God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Another thing that attitude of gratitude does for us is it helps us to realize and be grateful for the ordinary things of life. Somebody said that many of us are like the man with his head on backwards. We don't recognize anything until it's passed by. Another benefit of an attitude of gratitude, and not just on a certain day of Thanksgiving, but an attitude is that it helps our anxieties. It really helps our anxiousness. Sometimes I get anxious. Sometimes I worry. Sometimes I do too much of that. But an attitude of gratitude helps us and leads us into a spirit of peace. This is what Paul said. This is what the New Testament says over in Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Don't be anxious. Don't, don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer, listen, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Did you get that? With thanksgiving. So often I come to prayer, Lord, I want this, Lord, I need that, Lord, please help me. But let's begin with 
a prayer of thanksgiving. Always, always have something for which to be thankful and praise to God. And that can help lead to that peace that passes all understanding. Colossians chapter uh, 3 verse 15 simply says, and be thankful, and be thankful. One more little verse I'll leave with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18. Look it up. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. You know what it says? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. Didn't say for everything. It said in every circumstance, in every circumstance, give thanks, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That's an attitude of gratitude. Thanksgiving Day will be here before we know it. But here's a story about a little four-year-old boy who on Thanksgiving Day one time asked to say the blessing, and they let him. And he started off, he started thanking God for all of his toys, every single one of them. He listed them. And then he started thanking God for his friends, and he began to name them, one after the other after the other. And the family was beginning to get a little antsy, you know. They were, they were getting hungry, ready to eat. He kept on. And then he started saying, thank you, God, for Mama. Thank you, God, for Daddy. Thank you, God, for Grandmama. Thank you, God, for, for Papa. Thank you, God, for Sister. And on and on, aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody. And then he turned to the food. Thank you, God, for the turkey. Thank you, God, for the dressing. Thank you, God, for the gravy. Thank you, God, for the sweet potato. Thank you, God, for the bread. And then he turned to the, to the dessert. Thank you, God, for the, for the pie. Thank you for the cake. And they really were getting kind of upset. And finally he stopped. And there was a pause. And he opened one eye. And he said, would God know I'm lying if I said thank you for the broccoli? Situations, circumstance, in everything, we have something for which to be thankful. God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, we're thankful. Help us to be thankful. Stir up an attitude of gratitude in us that we might encourage others and glorify you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you for its history. Thank you for its ministry. Thank you for its future. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. With an attitude of gratitude, amen.